This is Ellen Mongan, and I am here with Deacon Pat, and this show is called Deacon and Deer. We're so glad you watching, and today's show will be titled Love in Action from 1 Corinthians 13. Go, Deacon Pat, what you got today? Well, it's called the Love Hymn <laughs> okay. that Paul wrote. Shall we sing it? And it's 1 <laughs> Corinthians 13, and it's all about love. That's right. That's right. And love and, is love is what? A feeling? No. Love is not a feeling. <laughs> love is doing for the other, thinking of others. And there's the Bible talks about different kinds of love. Oh, that's good. But the one that we really want to emulate is the love that Jesus showed us. And the way he showed us is he got upon the cross. Tell us he the died kind of for us. But tell us the three kinds of love. Do you refresh our memory? Because some people don't well, know that. I think all love is like a, like a, I love pizza, or I love, I love a puppy, or this I love, this is from, I love my best friend. Uh, a excellent uh, encyclical to read, which is Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical on Christian love. Okay. And so in there he explains three kinds of love. He explains eros, which most of us know, especially eros is really the kind of physical attraction and love that a man and woman should have, uh, but it shouldn't be just that. And that kind of love should progress to agape love, which is the kind of unconditional love that Jesus showed us by getting up on the cross. And then there's filial love, or phileo, in terms of brotherly love that we have for friends and brothers and sisters. But the ultimate goal is to show agape love. Thank you. I gave, it, gave a homily the other day on, on this very topic, 1 Corinthians 13. I said, well, today we should talk about that because it was so informative. Now, I know Deacon Pat, and I'm, when he speaks or gives a story, I've heard it before, and I always enjoy hearing it again. But this is new, and a lot of it, the way he took it, his take on it. So tell, us, tell them what we want, which direction you want to go. Well, Paul, he starts out, and he says, are you a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal? And certainly at times, I'm sure my wife can attest to, <laughs> I can be a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And, so and that's true of all of us in terms of because we're human. And that's why love is about a commitment. That's why our marriage vows are so important in terms of saying through thick and thin, through you know sickness, health, whatever. Whatever happens, that we're going to stick by each other because difficult times will come in every marriage, every relationship. And we just need to make that commitment because when we get on the other side, hopefully we are better as That's a couple, right. better I think, people. I think too that it's easy when your husband goes down, say he has an operation or your wife gets a little overwhelmed with the children. It's easy to love and pick up the slack. The hard part, Pat and I found is when both people go down at once. Now there, there's a test of your marriage and there's a test of that grace comes from the sacrament. Amen. Yes, and so, we all need grace because it is difficult, and as I mentioned last time, we see the fall that uh, because men and women don't trust each other because of sin and our sinful nature and concupiscence that uh, we don't trust, and therefore we are looking often for excuses to leave or break the marriage, and that's why we need to see that we need God's grace because that's, that's what he wants. Because Jesus never gives up on us. That's right. And we, we give up on him. That's right. I have not looked for ways to end the marriage, honey. <laughs> Even looking for, I'm kind of like a spy cam, I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> no, it's true that we all have a temptation. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil we're fighting. And if we keep our eyes on Jesus by surrounding ourselves with Christian couples, that's what I believe in, and they are pointing towards heaven and towards loving your husband, then you begin to grow in the marriage. If you surround yourself with people that are, are kind of dishing their husband or not liking their marriage, it kind of makes it hard. Yeah, and you got to avoid that near occasion of sin. That's right. Yeah. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God comes to give life and abundance. You don't want to be the one stealing the joy from your husband or putting them in the road of temptation because, like, here, honey, try this. <laughs> and then it's not really helpful. Pat and I have a way of telling each other if we think that there's... A, a person that could be a temptation. I, at least I do more than he does because women, it's when they go like this. And he goes, honey, I'm thinking of that girl 
is looking at you instead of her husband. I don't know. Maybe a thought, a clue. But if we are unable to listen, then we could fall into them calling us or writing us or we know that it's important, right? right. It's an important thing. Uh, and, and the eyes to see yeah, the white. Yeah, exactly. And we, so and in my today. particular myself, is like, I'm not interested and it's, I'm not really tempted. But the, the trouble is that uh, over time, you know, you find you're in a, you know, a difficult situation. Uh, there, there's a strained marriage and then somebody's giving you undue attention. No, what's your you advice, could, Deacon, dear? To the people out there listening. Avoid the near occasion. Say, run away. Run away. I like to say, yeah. That's what, I don't have to do that because I have the five minute rule. I tell my friends, oh, I don't have it. I say, if I'm attracted to someone and I'm talking and they're engaged in talking to me because you could tell as a woman, you could tell. And I go like this, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it only turns them off because the other near occasion is sin. I so believe in it. Don't just stand there and say, well, let's do lunch or let's, let's get together. Call me anytime you want to talk. That would be opening the door to the, the near occasion of sin, the world, yeah. flesh, and the devil. Yeah. Some people are not that astounded, I guess. I think it is important to know that if you have a lot of experience with the opposite sex, you're actually more quick to know this is off. And if you're not, then you're going like this. I'm not saying sit in bed with someone. I'm saying like more experience in knowing that women and men think and act differently. Men are visual. Women are engaged in like attention so what do you think Deacon? tend to be more word-minded right in terms of looking for affirmation and um, i don't know i don't know it's just i don't know it's, it's just it's like almost like a scent <laughs> it's not sure, a skunk but it could sure. be so would you go on deacon on me to interrupt you i didn't mean to lead us down that path i just we pray before we have the mm. show i did lead me to lead you down the show <laughs> i did not no, i think i think that's you we see because we're in a culture that thinks divorce is no big deal, mm -hmm. and we've seen it in our family. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. It's it's the gift that keeps on giving pain I was you said. year <laughs> after year after year. And you know what hurts the most? The children, right? The children. Yes, the children. It the comes out of your pocket. On them, the money. It's awful. It's just awful. But you know what? Everything is redeemable in Christ. You know, we all make mistakes. We don't want to ever go. Da -da 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 -da. It's a woman. You did it. It's your fault. We, we look at ourselves. That's why parents are so important in an in adult child's life. We look at our life. We have made mistakes. But, and parents always can see it coming. They're making a mistake on this job or this this person. And they can't always really say it because when you say it, it puts them more into like making more mistakes. They go deeper into the mistake. So we try to silence and only give advice when we're asked. But then we try to support and be there. You know, marriages need a lot of prayer as a parent you pray. My one friend, Debbie Cosper, when she goes to daily mass every day, she, she puts her kids in the cup. When they lift the, the um, blood of Jesus, she says, I put my family in the cup. Now, I think that's, a, I hope she don't mind me sharing. I think it's a beautiful tradition. All of the people I talk about, I'm doing that too. We only can survive a life on this earth through the grace of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we go right down with them. I used to say, my kids went to college and I avoided college. I left early because I lots of temptation. I think I just joined in. I'm not saying every kid, but I go, some people are like, that was like, they didn't notice, but this is light and this is darkness and which way are you going to choose? There's, we're the road not taken. Right where the road not taken, the narrow road. Yep. Amen. So go. My Israel, well, gonna, you're not going to give your talk. You'll call my my co-host right. talks too much and then, go ahead. Well, <laughs> The, the scripture verse we're looking at, um, really it starts out with Paul saying, brothers and sisters, strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts, but I shall show you a more excellent way. And the context there is that in the previous chapter, Paul has been dealing with problems in terms of charismatic gifts. Oh. You know, all baptized received Isaiah gifts of wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord. This comes with baptism, the grace of baptism for everyone. But then there are specific gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to people to help the body of Christ, to build up the body of Christ. And in the Catholic Church in the 70s, there was a charismatic renewal, and there are a lot of people who got together in this outpouring of the Spirit, and there was a big focus on the gifts because 
people tend to minimize the gifts of the Spirit uh, for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why. Um, because we have the gospel, we have the fully written word. But Jesus didn't say, and Paul didn't say, oh, we're going to have these gifts in the early church and then they're going to go away. Mm -hmm. No, they've always been present. Right. It's just we have to be open to them. And that appears to be the problem, that over time people became less open to the Holy Spirit working in their lives. But we all should be seeking, well, what gifts does the Holy Spirit want for me but they're not for me, they're for the body of Christ. And the problem is sometimes people get carried away with thinking how important they are because they have some special gift. And Paul's talking about, hey, it's not about you. What gift, whatever you have, right. it's about love. It's about the gift giver, Jesus, right. who is love. He's our example of love. And it's not to seek the gifts to benefit me, to look good, to become popular, to be famous, uh, or, or be prideful. No, in humility, we understand that the gifts come from Jesus. And the gifts are given at confirmation. But I think it's like a present that you're, they your Aunt they Matilda get, gave you. They you think get it's underwear, so you don't open it. And then you yeah. see that it was like precious diamond. Yeah. Rough. I mean, yeah. you don't. they are given, but we, if we don't open them or develop them, them right. or someone doesn't call them out, then we think, what do I have for a gift? We always called the gifts out on our children. We did. We made a point to say, you have gifts. Amen. You're very gifted, huh, dear. Thank you. You are. <laughs> but we're not pride because we but know. we have different gifts. <laughs> we have di very different gifts, as you see, our style. But still, we don't be prideful about them because I, for me, I personally know that I didn't have these gifts before. I gave my whole heart to Jesus and started walking in them. And he will, he'll walk you step by step. I had some teaching gifts before you were a Christian, but then God right. developed into spiritual gifts too. Right. That some gifts that you seem to may have in your, um, like your job or profession, uh, may be natural so. gifts that God has given you that he then wants you to use to build the kingdom. Uh, but then he may have other very unique gifts that he wants. And one of the gifts that Paul talks about that tends to be controversial is uh, tongues. And he mm -hmm. even says in here, if I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. Um, he's not saying don't use your gift of tongues. He's just saying what what's really important? What is your motive for exercising the gifts? And I like to say, you know, and what I said in my homily was, for people as you read 1 Corinthians 13, which I would encourage everybody to read on a regular basis, to remind yourself what Paul talks about in terms of love. But how does those words apply to family, especially your spouse, uh, friends, and strangers? Mm -hmm. um, because God has called us to love as he says, even our enemies. Well, I guess it's about tongues so someone doesn't turn us off because, you know, this is Deacon here. We're trying to help you out to grow in Christ and to love one another. I went to a priest. It did bother me about tongues. I was given that gift, but I was actually given it. I asked the Lord by myself in my own prayer closet, saying, Lord, this is for real. When I experienced the charismatic renewal in the 70s, I didn't know if it was Catholic or Protestant or even got good enough or even, is it okay, Lord? And, um, then, then I went to a priest after we left a Christian community and said, by the way, um, what do you think about that? And it was a wise priest. He said to me in confession, he said, whenever there's a gift of tongues in a meeting, it should have interpretation. But if it's just you alone, you could use tongues on your own prayer language. That's your prayer. But you don't need to be, you don't need to be using tongues in a meeting if it's not where you're be. So I, I Edifying. You know, it's not, that's right. The body of That's Christ. Right. It's not the, it's not the greatest uh, gift, and don't get hung up on it because in my life, if God wants me to have something, He does, and it always fits my personality, it fits my gifts, and it fits my um my um just who I am. I right. never have to worry like is right. God going to call me to Africa to to speak to the missionaries because we know I don't have the right clothes. <laughs> and, and we <laughs> no, we, we want to be clear that the charismatic renewal, there is an office in the. Uh, USCCB for the Charismatics because it is a recognized part of the church. That's the beauty of the church. There's lots of treasures, I like to say, in the Catholic Church, and you could spend your lifetime searching them out. 
That's and you right. won't be able to discover or participate in all of them. That's the beauty. There's something for everybody. That's there, right. Everybody has a gift. What's everybody yours? Somewhere. That's good. Oh, yeah, what's your gift? Take some time to pray this week and ask the Lord to show you. You know, if you listen, he doesn't talk while you're talking. You have to be really, really quiet. It's a, it's a still, small voice. Not in the thunder, not in the ma- in the wind, but in the quietness. Not a noisy gong. <laughs> not a noisy gong, long, long. You know, I, my friends and I were having a tree, honey, and one friend kept going, we, had got our, we got up early, two of us gals, and got our prayer time. I prayed like from three in the morning to five, and I woke up and, at seven and did another prayer time, and she goes, I got my prayer time, I got to be really quiet. And I'm thinking, yes, no one can have their prayer time. If you're talking to Jesus, you really can't hear him. But he really wants to get through, even if you're talking, he will get through. But there's ways he gets through. We'll talk about another right. show. Talking to God's good, but you got to listen to. Listening is important. Love is patient. And you know that's really important <laughs> in this world. Yes, in Do terms that. of somebody you know, a spouse. I probably the the person I have the hardest time being patient with is my wife. I have higher expectations, and and that's just not right. And you're saying know, that's my first mistake of the day, honey. Sorry. Tell me this though. Do you think this world is more patient than we began the journey in 1974 together, hand in hand? Do you think? No, it's, I think it's less patient. And I wonder what the reason is. I may blame the cell phone. <laughs> What do you think? Oh, I think our culture has become a less loving culture. It's a more negative culture. People looking for faults. Uh, people are more polarized, um, thinking more negative, and a big part of that is uh, social media, the news, etc. Um, that sounds like fear time. Rather than you're scared. keeping our eye on Jesus. That's good. Patience is a good one. Patience. With the children, I used to sing, have patience every day. But then when I sing it, it doesn't make them happy. They think, you know, that was usually when you're impatient. You're already over the top and someone's on your last nerve and you're getting out and if you make a joke, not uh-huh. funny. So patience is Well, hard. isn't it interesting? He starts out with that. Uh-huh. Does he because make a joke? No, love is patient. Because... Oh, hardest one? I think because it sets the stage for the others. Oh. That if you're patient with somebody, then it allows you to be able to do the other aspects of love okay. and it, it's a it's an act of humility mm-hmm. to be patient with others it's recognizing that the other person is human they're imperfect and uh, it also hopefully if you're really patient you're looking and considering do I have a plank oh, in my right. eye that's while right. I'm looking at the splinter in somebody else's eye okay. so it's a good way to start out I like that. You know, Pat and I try to be patient with each other on scheduling. If you're an empty nester and you never lived alone with your husband without any children or any mother or just the two of you, it's not when you first get married, it's like honeymoon and you love that. And when you get to empty nest, it's honeymoon again. We had this idea to like say, to, to try to get along on time management. I did not realize that my guy is a little more laid back than I'm like intense. So we would say, we're going to go, um, I guess, out to eat at 5. And I go, okay. I get ready. I'll dress, makeup on, stand with my purse. I'm ready. Oh, can we have another half hour? So I go, okay. So I get busy, right? I'm thinking, I don't look at the clock ever. I'm getting busy. And I go, you ready? It's time to go. And I go, no. Guilty. I, <laughs> no, but I was just saying that. I go, can, I, can you give me five more minutes? Well, five would turn to ten. Then we go, like, let's just not go out to eat. And it was crazy. So we, in our marriage, may it won't work for everybody, have said, Pat's going to call the time, and then I'm going to say, give me five minutes. It works because Pat's a deacon. We can't go a half hour later if he's got to be on the altar. So we, we go like this. Okay, it's going to be, we're leaving at 20 up. Now, I don't look at the clock, so I'm always going, just give me the five-minute warning, honey. And it does work, right? Mm-hmm. The five-minute warning works. But if I had to be a person that really wanted it to be five o'clock, when we said it, it would have been like a impatient fight. Mm-hmm. Probably been... Two impatient fights. Mm-hmm. And that's being kind. Love is kind. That's okay then. One point for me. Clong, 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 clong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a noisy clong. I was not happy. It took me a long time so, to go, who doesn't manage their time? Who's that free spirited? I had eight kids. I was like, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Different. See, we're opposites. That's yeah. we want to get across. So we're love opposites. is kind, and that means you're thinking about what you do. How does it affect others? Oh, I was thinking of surviving because I didn't want to always have to go look at my clock and you say five minutes. So but, I think it's great. But, but being kind, it's in terms of action, is okay. How, what what am I doing and how does it affect others? Okay, 
and but, then but he's... probably what I see happening more often is the words we use with each other. Okay, what well, one is that? Patient how, how... or impatient? <laughs> Could be impatience is causing unkind words, that's we are for actually, sure. We are actually imperfect people love loving each other imperfectly. We really are. And, you know, we thought we were perfect until we met. We both. She did. did you think we thought we were per- I thought we were perfect. We used to teach engaged couples and think we, I thought we were perfect. And then we, you know, that's when you have your husband on a pedestal and you think, well, he's the best thing ever. And he is. You are the best thing ever, honey. But I used to have, he had a shirt that we, I called it, it was called Perfect Pat, the Perfect Pat shirt. And then we got in the ministry and you know what? All your flaws begin to show because God calls you to higher bar if you're serving him. You can't just have your poop sink and not right. flush it. Right. <laughs> so, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. That's a hard one for me because I have that. Not, mm. I'm not jealous of your gifts or your hair. I'm not jealous of your feet or your shirt. I don't like if people cross the line and you don't see it. I just don't. But you don't see it, so that's... Love yeah, is blind. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, but yeah, there can be jealousy in terms of men and women in terms of relationships, but it can be jealous about somebody's gotten some good fortune. Mm-hmm. They've got a better job. They got a promotion. Um, so we should be happy for people. Is that but in our culture, it's often it's like, how come oh, they got that? Or, you know, what, what did they do to deserve that? Mm-hmm. Well, that's really none of our business, you know? Sure. We should be sure. thankful for what we have. And as Jesus says, is we shouldn't care if somebody else gets blessed. Sure. Yeah. I think because it's good. Rejoice with those yeah. who rejoice. Right. And exactly. sorrow with those who sorrow. Some people don't know that. You know, it's a scripture. If they're happy, their child's getting married, or maybe they, their husband is getting to do something really neat in um, his career, I really am happy. But then I have other jealousy mm-hmm. issues. No one's exempt from any of these faults. <laughs> Give it on a good day or bad. Well, and, show and you, as we read them. You do that. Especially yeah. point fingers. Da, da, da. They do it. They go, where my God says, you could do that too. And he pulls away the grace sometimes. It shows you how. Well, there's enough see. of them that the probability is that several are areas of weakness. Oh, okay. And that's the thing is that we can say, oh, well, that's I'm doing okay with that and that. But if you go through the list sure. and you think you got them all perfect, well, then you are definitely on the way to sainthood if you are <laughs> not already a saint. You think if you got them all perfect, you're on the way to, If you think you got them perfect, aren't you on the way to pride? No, I would say so. <laughs> you're a saint, but you have a little bit of pride. I told the gals this weekend, honey, I always go to confession. I used to go behind the, face-to-face because I really do know some of the priests, and I feel like they'll know my voice anyways. But I, I used to confess my sins. I'd bring a little list and read them because I always get nervous and then I go and pride because I think pride's the last to fall it's kind of like when you're a movie when you're on a pageant you pageant and go like and world peace it's and pride pride is the hard one you you really look around if you see someone without pride please tell me and I want to meet that person and I want to mentor them I want to study what they do we all have pride it's the, it's why they fell in the garden I mean who I mean there's yeah. so many there's so many ways you can have pride. It's not just oh, one yeah. flavor of pride. You have pride in your looks, you have pride in your your accomplishments, you have pride in your children. We all have pride. Please look in the mirror and see that but without without God, we are sinners, right? Yeah. All have sinned yep. and all of, short. And if you God's say you worried. haven't sinned, you're, you're a, liar. a liar. You're a liar. So Deacon dear, we are not liars. We are a normal couple and the opposite couple at that. So, Amen. I told this would be a, this would be a monologue. And I just I tricked him. I would never right. do a monologue. It's not as entertaining as when he's right. the homily. He's used to a monologue, but it's more entertaining to to when you learn a lesson, and it's dry. It, it sticks in. But when you tell stories and you're really yourself, you're real, you're real, Deacon, and I'm real as it myself. It does help. Someone, Pat and I speak a lot together when we lived in Georgia. And um, the woman would, not only women, people would come to me and go like, I really got what you said. But I, it was like over my head. And then people would come to me and go like, I totally got you, Deacon Pat, but your wife, <laughs> blonde. You know and that is the way it is. Every speaker is going to minister to someone. Right. And sometimes if you listen to something twice, not just once, but twice, a point you passed over because it was, something you weren't listening, you were, may answer your phone, right. if you answer your phone, put it down, then you would be able to hear it, the, what right. God's saying to you. God right. speaks in many ways. Right. Well, as Paul talks about, okay. um, and when you're teaching or a homily or whatever is, uh, Paul talks about giving meat That's and right. milk. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason is what are somebody, what are they ready to digest? 
what right. can they handle? That's right. And so when you're talking to people, you want to be able to give some of both, both. because the audiences are usually going to be mixed, where some are ready for meat, some are really just at the stage of just keep giving me milk until mm -hmm. I'm ready to digest meat. Well, Pat, is, Pat does give meat, but I give like a spoonful of sugar with a cookie to, to put the medicine. I mean, I really do believe that that meat comes in all different factors, but I, I do believe that some people are just oh, yeah. fun to tickle their ears sure. as well. Do you think tickle sure. their ears oh, like, absolutely. you know, uh, I Tell don't... Tell me what I want to hear. Exactly. Love is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. Mm. And I kind of lump those together because they obviously have a lot to do with being humble. Okay. and relating to people in a humble manner to put other people first before yourself but we not think rude. that you're better than other people because we te tend to be rude and it's like the kindness we tend to be rude because we think we're just thinking about what we want mm -hmm. we're thinking just about ourselves and how it affects us and not others but do and, you remember and, you said about rude was like to you rude is we're pro culturally sure. I'm Italian family raised in like 12 years in the north with northern parents and the rest of my 67 years in the south and I have certain high bar on certain manners that Pat doesn't yeah. have the same high bar and then he is raised all right. over the country military and exactly. family and that's why that's that's a tricky one because um, some of this is very much culturally bound it's what so would is. be what would be rude in one country um, and polite in another country may be just the opposite. Like we have our daughter-in-law visiting us, she's from Japan. And I have to always explain to her that, you know, this isn't really how Americans do it, just me. So they, my son and her explained to us that in Japan, you eat your meal, this is just discussion, but you can tell them the spaghetti. You eat your meal and you don't really chat that much. Well, I chat that much. If I'm with people, I chat. And if I'm not with people, I pray in silence. I, I write in silence. I go to church in town, so my time to talk is when I'm with people. And so I thought, whoa, I said, I'm so sorry, Tomoko. Everyone in America doesn't talk all the time like me, just me. So I don't want her to think Americans are like chatty Cathy. So then she told well, the spaghetti. Remember but that's spaghetti? why being patient with other people because uh, well, she didn't it, tell it's me. not even just within culture. It's within, as Ellen's pointing out, is a family has its own culture. Sure. And what's rude in that culture may not be. Some cultures... And some families, to raise your voice, mm -hmm. you know, to, in discussing things, sure. is perfectly acceptable. In some families, it's like they never an argue. insult. They never and, you argue. Know, yeah. You're like, what? <laughs> there was, um, there is true though. In our home, we did have a little girl come to our house when she was really little, and our family was large, seven children, and then she made eight or there's extra kids, and she couldn't believe our family all talked. The person next to her across the table. She said, oh, in our family, we talk one at a time. Well, they had a lot of children too, but not as many as ours, maybe half. And I go, whoa, you would never get to say anything. So we, we just know that that for us was the way we did it. And it and worked. It worked. That's how it is. Yeah. Rude. It wasn't rude to us, but if you come to our home, we'll invite you to sit down and we'll let you have a turn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we'll give you a mic. Don, get a mic. What, what my wife likes to say is she likes, because we've lived in the South most of our life, she and we don't likes say me to be a southern gentleman. I do like opening the, the door gentleman. and stuff, and I think that's great. And she, he's like gotten to the khaki pants and golf shirt. Yeah, but I'm still waiting. Whereas he fits in um, Hawaii or Florida with his shirt. Did we do that opposite too, honey. See, in our and Pat, in my marriage, it's okay for me to dress up fully dressed like Barbie. I'm not saying some people don't like Barbie. But dress up like a woman, like an Esther woman. It's okay to go in a restaurant. Me wearing a black dress with pearls. And Pat wears the Hawaiian shirt. To me, that's so awesome. But to some families, the wife will go like, are you going to change your shirt, honey? Are you, are you? I do ask him certain things, but not that. That's what we, we agree on that. We think, I like fashion. Pat likes relax. And again, it's the whole thing about free-spirited. And then me, the rigid wife. <laughs> that's how it is, right? It is. Yep. Yeah, it is true. It's true. I'm scheduled, and I'm, I'm not perfectionist, though. No. I'm not. That I'm not. Me. <laughs> If you're gonna do it, do it right. He's a perfectionist with the laid back look and the laid back edge. I'm a, I'm rigid, but I'm actually not a perfectionist. Right. So that's my first mistake of the day. But and you're supposed to have a signal. Like, that's boop. right. <laughs> Love does not <laughs> seek its own interests. That's right. Which again is related to humility. But mm -hmm. you know, like when you're lining up, are you barging ahead of people? 
Mm. You always want to be the first in line. Mm. You're always thinking about yourself and going ahead and um, going ahead of your wife, which I tend to just because I'm just a fast walker, <laughs> I have to I always slow down, you know, uh, for my wife. Um, what do you think about that culturally? Is that everybody? Because some cultures, the husbands walk in front of the wife. I explain yeah, myself. No, no. Well, he's not. He's really from another Yes, it country. is some cultures, but we're not. <laughs> we're not promoting that. No, right. I think it's true, though, honey. It is to me. It was like it's an honoring thing to walk with them, but you don't. And what can you do? I mean, I really am a slow walker on purpose. I wear the heels to slow me down because in my other life, not my real other life, I say before, after before children, I was probably I wore heels a lot. And then you have children, you don't wear them. When you wear heels, you do walk slower, but it makes your life. You smell the roses. You take. You enjoy the journey. You purposing to not miss a moment. That's my theory. Sure. Because I rush to the kids a lot. Sure. What they go? Like, hurry up! Hurry up! Hurry up! Yeah. And sometimes it's just my problem is just not really being in the moment in terms of thinking. You just so being brilliant. preoccupied. My husband's is brilliant, so he he has a lot of things to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Love is not quick tempered. Ooh. Again, goes along with patience, right? <laughs> if you're patient, works. you're a whole lot less likely to be quick-tempered, to get upset. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, where do they get upset? In traffic and, you know, somebody cuts in front Disney of them World. or whatever. Or, or <laughs> you know, races ahead and, and cuts them off and uh, they blow up. Well, you know, we need to be slow. And as Paul says, mm -hmm. be slow to anger. Quick to Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We failed in that scripture, but we are going to put it into action tomorrow. As I tell yeah. the guy, I'm going to hurry, but tomorrow I'm going to slow down. How be about, angry, how about, but don't How sin. about the opposite of that kind of anger? Because that be, you would be more the anger, and I'd be more the bitterness. We were talking with my mom today, and it was quite telling of what... Sometimes you say, it's all right. No, it's all right. Take It's all right. And then you get mad because it's not all right after all. And, and you said, why don't you tell people when you're mad? It's because people don't know they're mad. This kind of person, my right. person, you sort of stuff and stuff and stuff. Maybe it's something simple as right. one kid goes, mom doesn't know what she's talking about. Or maybe it's simple as saying, I don't, it's like the one too many thing. And you go, you don't know you're mad. And then all of a sudden you get angry. It's like same like being bitterness for people. Right. Don't know how to deal with anger. The sort of straw that broke the camel's oh, back. But the point, but the good, the, the thing is, is this 1 Corinthians 13 okay. is a good thing to do at night. Um, just in terms of, um, like, an, as an examination of conscience. Oh, that's good. How that's did good. you treat people today? Today, and, and if you did get angry, why? Mm -hmm, What's going on? Or if something irritated you, if you were less patient, well, why? That's real good. Weren't you patient? It's um, like like some. And focusing on, uh, uh, in many ways, a more positive approach to an examination of conscience. I think that's good. But the people that do stuff, um, they should probably. Get it out with somebody. You can't get it out with everybody. You gotta right. go. So you gotta take yourself aside and say, you, you need know, to pray about it and be prudent. It's not just a confession thing. It's like if it's a habit pattern and, you, and your person does it. It's almost like not being in tune with what's making you angry. It's almost right. like not being in tune with yourself as much until it it um, volcanoes out. Then you go, okay, I totally clearly I'm something was bothering you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think you have the, you it have was the it was bothering you and then boom. Yeah, I like we, we, that's a, that's an important lesson. I don't know. The anger people just figure like, I'm, well, I'm fine now. And the other person is going like, there's a knife in my heart and I'm and, so not fine. And, and that help me. I'm drunk. goes along with the next one. Okay, it's kind of lead it does not brood <laughs> over injury. Ooh, that's a hard one and too. So that's, but that's part of it is yeah. it, it, it was like a little people. injury wasn't okay. enough to really make you cut the heart open full. at that t point. But it's a, a little bit and it's a little, another one piling. It's like a sore. Mm. And you keep rubbing the sore until it's a really big sore. And then what happens? And then you've been in those kind of it gets infected and, 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 and what so, it does is <laughs> odorous. It, it can be. I know, I'm like, okay, then you just have to repair that relation and go like, gee, I volcanoed out. I don't know why I did that, but I'm really sorry. It's how it is. And marriage is so important. If you stuff, and then the other guy has no idea. Because you didn't ever tell them, right? Then they're going and, like, whoa, I thought we both liked ice cream. And Jesus <laughs> has the answer. What does he say? Put in the light. 
that's good but also forgive seven times 77 oh i do like that scripture. yes forgive forgive never, forgive never forgive and you know i think the part we miss often okay. when we talk about forgiving okay and we say the our father okay. is he says forgive from the heart and that's a job that's a job only god can do yep. he's got to change your heart he helps you he's got to change your but heart but you have to be willing to forgive and willing to ask for help and so what I always like to tell people, if you're brooding over an injury okay. or having a hard time forgiving somebody, you know, ask God mm -hmm. to point out and remind you all he's done for you and to pray for them. You can at least say, well, God bless them. And mm -hmm. if you can't even say that, That's easy then the say, Lord, help me <laughs> to be able to pray for them. No, but everything in the South gives you, the, the, when you live in the South, you can easily say, bless their heart and bless them it's, it's actually easier than you just go like okay i'm clearly i'm gonna avoid that person i'm like oh no i don't know it's easier in the north i think it's more apt to be able to I man i'm categorizing but is it more north to go forward and just say it and the south to think about it and then just say okay i'm gonna stuff that i'm gonna suffer that one to christ i say that with myself i'm gonna suffer that one to christ and then all of a sudden I go like, wait, well, why am I suffering all the ones under Christ? <laughs> that does you, tend to be, that, yes, Christ? there are differences. It does tend to be more of a Southern culture. But these days, okay. there's so much mixing and people moving around so much that those distinct cultures are, I think, fading. Okay. That we're getting okay. a mix because lots of people from North are moving into the South mm. and even Southern people moving up North. And so... Culture, our culture is being coming a little more homogenous. Okay, well that's good. You know, I think this: no one's perfect, but that's no excuse to not try, right? You have to try. Is there any more on this list before I? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're gonna keep going. It does not but rejoice you... over wrongdoing, but oh, rejoices with the truth. It doesn't go. Ha ha ha! Nasty. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Gotcha. Like, like in the old days, when the mother says, "If you if you don't obey me, God's gonna get you." Yeah. <laughs> That's the wrong doing. Don't do that, Mom. I no, would say no. no. I would say we would sing. When but, something bad oh. happens to somebody, we should never rejoice over that. Well, it's it's hard because you don't want you don't want people to learn the hard way. My friend Anna always says you can learn this easy way or the hard way. They have to learn. It's like a child that I always use toilet training because that was like my job. Some kids don't learn to toilet train if you just like let them go. Hey, do whatever you want. They have to learn the job. If they don't learn it, you start out easy, giving the M&Ms, and here, I bless you, you do it, say thank you, say please, I bless you. And then if they don't learn, you kind of have to be a little... Well, but I think oh, that's but that, that the way I would look at it in, ver in light of what Paul is saying here is you don't rejoice in having to discipline your children. I so didn't like disciplining my children. Yeah. I did it. I did it. It was against my right. nature yeah. because I'm yeah. not, a, um, I'm not like do authoritarian. You it it's you do it in the Lord because it's good for them that you because you care for them you're doing it but if you're doing it because you're getting pleasure out of disciplining them mm -hmm. or spanking them and there's nothing wrong with spanking if it's done in a in godly way. That way we'll talk about one day right because yeah. we have that way I think it bore fruit but you shouldn't be excited to do it or sure. think, oh this is great I'm getting to beat mm -hmm. my kid yeah, and I used to pray for my kids. I thought they would want to obey. I was an obedient kind of child. I thought they would want to, like follow, and I say do it. They were going to do it. But God has, says to train up your children, and that's how He trains us up. He trains us up according to the Word of God, according to the, the Catholic faith, and well, the Christian people that are Christian, they're listening, and He trains us up in love. I don't think God is like pointing fingers, going, "I got you," or you did it again. Some people still believe in it. May maybe a Catholic teaching. They still count like I did this three times or four times when they go to confession. But I don't think God's sitting there going, He's going to see a pattern in your life, and you're if you're close to Jesus, you're going to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit when you do something wrong. The first time you do it, you're going to feel really bad. Now, if you don't confess it or go to confession and you continue that sin, sin, some of you don't even notice it, and then then your sin grows. It grows big, and so. You have to be willing to have someone accountable in your life, your your spouse and then friends. But you have to know that God's not going to ever point fingers, even if you're deep in the heart of sin, like deep. He, he's not going to do it. He's going to allow circumstances to teach you. He's going to allow people from the pulpit to say the words and it's going to go, whoa, I do that. You know, it's not going to be like a point of fingers. I don't think. Now, am I wrong? Deacon? Because I'm just a deer. <laughs> he's, he's, gonna, he's going to want to help you 
see your sin with not the idea of beating you up, but for you to change for the better, to become more like Him. And, th and that's we start out on gifts, and that's why to me, I like gifts, you know, it's Christmas, it's birthday, but the truth is in Christ, He's trying to make us in the, the image and likeness of, of His Son. God the Father is trying to make us in the image and likeness of His Son, Jesus. Now, because we're sinners, it's not our natural impulse, and so He has to work with us the way we're going to hear Him. And so I always have concentrated, even with the children, on virtue over gifts. You know, because virtue is something we have to grow. The fruits of the Spirit, we grow in our heart. They're not like free gifts. Here, magic wand, you're patient, I'm, I'm kind, you're, you're what we brought back. No, it's, the gifts have to be given, freely given, freely received. The fruits of the Spirit are what God instills in our heart through lessons learned by choosing virtue over flesh. It's no other way. It's like, like you, you, don't wake, you don't wake up one morning and go like this. Hmm. I was impatient yesterday, but maybe the most patient person in the world today. It's like one step towards Jesus, death of flesh and, and grace of the Lord pour in. That's why prayer is so essential. Don't you think yeah. when you have your prayer time and you say, here I am, Lord, what do I need to work on? It may be one little thing. You're like, that's not important. It is. It's a step towards him to change and then and if you are listening he you could grow too much is given much will be expected and he'll give more he never expects a baby christian to go up there and do missionary work and save the world for christ he expects them to learn and grow and then they become stronger like the little mustard seed amen are you a mustard yeah. seed i hope you once you are you are you were once a little mustard seed and then you grew Love bears all things, oh, there you're this. <laughs> believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Mm. And all that you can really summarize in terms of life is tough. There are struggles, there's pain, there's suffering. Because we live in a fallen world. And to persist in the faith. that Love is Jesus and therefore to persist in our relationship with Jesus to the very end, which is what we want. So we can be in heaven with him and with our family and spouses in heaven. We bear these things and keeping our eye on the goal of being with Jesus, being like Jesus, being loving because Jesus was loving. Mm -hmm. So we can believe all that he has for us. We can deal with what comes our way because we know in the end we're going to have love because Jesus is with us. He's helping us. He's carrying us. And he never fails. Amen. Love never fails. We fail, but he doesn't fail. And we may see that things are very difficult and we think Jesus' love has failed. But we have to keep that eternal perspective. That's right. Keep because God doesn't promise a rose garden. He says, what? If you want to be like me, you want to be my follower, pick up your cross and follow me. Amen. Because... The cross is the loving thing to do like he did. He picked up his cross so that we might have eternal life. And Deacon Pat, I failed on the last show we did. I don't know which one it was. I think it was called Living in Love. Pat and I do a book every, we, we, we read a book together and we talk about just like we're doing today, talking and reading and praying. And um, I was talking about the five languages of love. And I said that it was Gary Smalley because we love him as well too. It wasn't Gary Small. It was Gary Chap. And so on behalf of Deacon and Deer, my faux pas, I apologize. I was I sometimes I open my mouth, insert my foot. Other times I do okay. So we do fail each other and our children. And I really do encourage those out there. If you're listening today, go back to your to your list. Sit down at prayer time. We are taking one a week because we're reading the book. The Love Dare. I'll hold it up. It's backwards. What do you think? Some are backwards too. And so it's, it's by Stephen and Alex Kendrick, and, and it's based upon 1 Corinthians 13. And Ellen and I, and I read through it, and I think it gives some good insights and worth reading together as a couple, as long as you can read it together not, and not go, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> but the thing is, we do read it, and so we're taking one a week because you might think, well, I got this one. No, read the chapter and think and pray, and then apologize for past things. We, we go, at least we go back to our children and say, when we were. We did this or that too. But we are trying to grow together as a couple, grow in our faith. I hope we are helpful to you too. This is Deacon and Deer. And this name of this was called 
love in action. So we're traveling along, along singing, singing a song, song side, side by side. side. We're Lord really good be, singers. <laughs> may the Lord be blessing you and helping you to love each other and to love all that you meet. God bless. Amen. <laughs>